lecture of the Rise and Tide Foundation's uh, second presentation in our new symposium um, on the Earth's next hundred years. Uh, we are continuing the theme. Th this particular symposium, we tried as best as we could to arrange the classes in the form of themes so that our minds could keep focused on an idea um, over the course of a couple of weeks with associated uh, writings for people to work on afterwards as well associated with each class. Uh, last week, we were introduced by Nicholas Jones to a wonderful presentation into the mind of, of Sheikh Anta Diop, the great Renaissance thinker, scientist, statesman um, in Africa from Senegal, whose ideas of a future Renaissance for all of humanity, as well as for especially for Africa, was based upon a, a deep study of universal history um, and a, a deep appreciation for the divine creativity innate in all human minds. And so that presentation dovetailed with some visions for the future, some great projects that are currently underway across Africa, which with the help of China are hopefully ushering in this new age of reason. Now there are also uh, opponents to this age of reason as I think we all here know in uh, very varying degrees uh, who would rather serve in hell than, or, sorry, <laughs> rule in hell than serve in heaven. Um, today, we're going to continue this theme with a class by Larry Freeman, a great friend of the Rise and Tide Foundation, who has delivered hundreds, if not thousands of presentations, uh, reports, assessments on, on colonialism in Africa, uh, great projects for, for Africa's future. And uh, Larry has a wonderful resource called Larry Lawrence Freeman. Uh, I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss uh, word it, Larry. What, what is the name of your, your website? Lawrence Freeman, Africa and the world.com. There we are. That is an amazing resource that everyone should bookmark and utilize. It just has the most incredible work on, on the history and on the future of that continent on a variety of degrees. Uh, Larry has published enormously. Like I said, his previous lectures will be linked in the description to this video. I won't say any more, but Larry, it's all yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Matt. And I'd like to, um, give a shout out to, I see my friend Joanna Myers is on from the continent of Africa itself. So we have, uh, we have a representative from across the pond. So welcome, Joanna. Uh, I guess I'll going to follow some of the ideas and um, that were presented by Nick last week and expand some of the material that he uh, gave to you. Uh, let me start off by just showing one picture first, if I can get my map uh, up here somewhere. Here it is. Okay, the reason I start with this, and I'm sure you all have seen it, is because it's, uh, it, first of all, it's counterintuitive, and it serves uh, as a metaphor of all the misconceptions, mis actually more misperceptions uh, of Africa because uh, almost everything that people think they know is wrong about Africa. And most of what they get is just from the news media and even the so-called Africanist in the United States, which I know most of them do not actually present the true picture and history and future and potential of, of Africa. So the map shows them that most many countries in the world can fit inside the continent. In fact, Africa is almost four times the size of continental United States. I think sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the Sahara itself is, is about the size of the United States. 
And the Congo River Basin, which Nick went into last week, is almost the size of the continental United States. Unfortunately, the reason I say misperception is because there's no map I've seen, flat map or globe, that has presented the true size of Africa. And that's why I say it's a metaphor for the fact that most of us get no truth about, about Africa. Uh, that's why I start with, with the map. Now let me go back uh, to everybody can see. I hope everybody can see me now. Uh, look, in many ways, I don't, I'm not really able to fulfill Matt's recommendation of going a thousand years ahead. I haven't got there yet. But we certainly can say that in this century, which there's 80 years left to, in this century, it's my view that Africa will play a dominant role in the, the affairs of the globe. That could be for good, that could be for bad. But there's no question in my mind that for a variety of reasons, all strategy, good and bad, for the next 80 years, especially the next 30 years, will involve and concern itself with the future of Africa. Therefore, it's very relevant that we concern ourselves with the future of Africa. And I say for good and for bad, because if you look at the demographics of Africa, they can either be very hopeful or very frightening. For example, Africa now has, to my best estimate, about 1.5 billion people uh, between Sub-Saharan Africa and the Maghreb. That is projected to be approximately, to increase to approximately 2.5 billion in uh, 28 years by 2050. And I hope most of us are still alive by then. I intend to be even though I'm 70 now. Now, the reason I bring this up is because 2.5 billion people, if it reaches that level, this is just a projection, it will make it not the largest country, because of course Africa has 54 countries and one disputed territory, but it will make it the largest continent population-wise. It will have approximately 1 billion youth, how, there are various ways people measure you. Sometimes it's 24 and below, sometimes it's 35 and below. But a billion youth will be in Africa. They will have the, the Af again, we're talking about the African continent, not the, there's not a nation in Africa. And the labor force will be larger than any labor force in the world. If you take one country itself, Nigeria, which now has about 210 million people, Nigeria is projected by 2050 to have 450 million people, which will actually make it, if the projection is accurate, the third largest country in the world. India will be number one, China will be number two, and Nigeria will be number three. And even though the United States population is about 330 million, it's approximately a third or no, 50% uh, larger than Nigeria, because us Westerners uh, don't like to procreate, Nigeria will be larger in the next uh, 28 years as projections go. These have major ramifications for not just Africa, but for the world. Now you, you could say, and I, this is what my feeling is that two and a half billion people and a, million, a billion young people is a bonus. It's a plus because you have all those young creative minds that are capable of making creative discoveries. And therefore that large section of the population is a benefit to all of humanity. If the labor force is put to work properly and uh, labor force being a very large category, I don't want to go into details, but it doesn't just include workers, it would include scientific and research employment as well. That can lead to enormous pro increased production of wealth for the world. And of course, for the major economic powers in the world, which is 
now China and the United States as the two largest powers, uh, this can provide a market that will be larger than any domestic market. And therefore, one of the questions that always comes up, and I saw it came up in Nick's class uh, last week, is where does anybody get out of investing in Africa? Well, they get a huge market to sell not only, uh, not primarily consumer goods, but to sell Africa the next higher level of capital goods, machine tools, more advanced technologies, et cetera. Therefore, you could say that this demographic bulge for the world, which will take place on the African continent, can actually lift up the entire world to a higher level of standard of living. On the other hand, it can also destroy the world or weaken the world. Because if these new entrants into the labor force or potential entrants into the labor force, and if these young people, approximately a billion, then they uh, are not employed, are not treated uh, as precious new individuals whose minds should be exploited. But these, these young people and these new, new entrants or potential entrants to the labor force, if they're left with the cancerous informal economy that treats human beings as beasts of labor standing on the side of the road in Africa selling consumer goods from Tupperware to chewing gum, then these young people and the, uh, will become, will turn against the governments, will turn against the nations. And the kind of crisis that we now see in Mali, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Chad, Northeast Nigeria, Southeast Congo, where we see massive poverty producing uh, increasing number of violent extremists that we will finally look back on as the good days if you don't employ properly and educate properly these young people and of course many cases in Africa today uh, they're not that's not taking place and there's a great degree of alienation and I would say a nihilism where many young people do not view the nation as representing their interest and looking out for their future and their children and their children's children. And this is a serious problem. Therefore, we're making a, a decision today about whether we're gonna have a planet that's gonna move forward, which in many ways can be spurred on uh, by the developments in Africa, or we're gonna look at a planet that is in decay and destruction and enters a dark age. Those are the kinds of considerations that I think about every day. And I think thoughtful people should be thinking about because it's really, it's up to us. And I say it's up to us because actually there is no objective reason for the existing conditions in Africa. Now they, as Nick presented last week, there is beginnings of a significant change taking place. And I think all anybody who observes the changes and the improvements would recognize that. On the other hand, then it's not adequate. It's, it's not sufficient. And therefore we have to, especially those of us in the West, we have to find the ways to mobilize governments and policymakers and other thoughtful people to engage in a much more robust policy uh, of development of Africa. But if you look at the conditions today, and I say there is no objective condition, and I, I'm, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm absolutely right. Uh, there's no objective condition for the level of hunger that exists in Africa, where people have to search every day. Mothers have to look every day for food to feed their children and give up their own meals so the children have meals. There's no objective reason for hunger. There's no objective reason for poverty. There's no objective reason for the amount of disease that spreads throughout Africa, which is primarily a result of weakened immune systems. There's no reason for the level of infant mortality. The millions of children that die before the age of five, most of the diseases, if not every death, 
is caused by diseases of which there is a known cure, respiratory diseases, cholera, etc. Only a small fraction of people die in Africa from war, which I know most people read as the headlines, but the war actually dislocates and causes all the other problems. It's not the bullet or the machete that produces the most deaths in Africa. Uh, infant mortality is ridiculous in Africa. Uh, maternal mortality, that is mothers who die from uh, at childbirth, is also absurd. Uh, and you can look at life expectancy. I mean, you have countries in Africa that have only marginally improved their life expectancy from the time of independence uh, around the 1960s or so to the current day. And again, that's, that's, not, a subjective, uh, that's not an objective problem. If you look at uh, China, for example, at the founding uh, of China in 1949, the life expectancy was about 36 years, which is comparable to many countries in Africa, higher than some, but comparable. Uh, if you look today, China now is uh, double, more than double the longevity of life for their citizens. And in many countries of Africa, we still have longevity of life in the 50s, in the 60s. That would mean, without implying anything negative to our audience, but many of us wouldn't be here with that level of longevity, myself included. And there's no reason for it. And then sort of China sort of proved the case because they started as a backward, underdeveloped country, as did we in the United States as an agrarian-based economy with no manufacturing, no infrastructure. Yet we emerged. Uh, the recent past is not glorious for us, but many points of the last 250 years were spectacular successes due to the American system of political economy. And China is the most modern, spectacular miracle of development where they've taken 750 million people or more, lifted them out of poverty, the total number of people listed in poverty for Africa is under 500 million. China lifted more people out of poverty than existing poverty in Africa, yet these same projections or similar projections uh, just over the next eight to 10 years, let's say around 2030, is that Africa will contain nine tenths of all people on the globe living in poverty. So you have extreme poverty in parts of Southeast Asia, you have extreme poverty in India, you have extreme poverty in parts of Ibero-America. But there is actually more progress being made in those areas in reducing poverty than is the case uh, in Africa. And so this is, uh, again, what, what causes this? Is, is this is not a question of resources. This is not a question of too many people. Uh, this is a question of, this is the result of a diseased way of thinking in the West, which is called geopolitics. And I say geopolitics is a disease because it's actually a, a, a distorted mental state of mind that it tries to impose on the world a limitation which the physical universe doesn't have. The, geopol the geopolitical doctrine of the oligarchy is that the world is fixed and that the only question is who has more than half the pie and who has less than half? Who's on top, who's on bottom? Who has their, their foot on the other country's throat and who's, uh, whose foot is on their throat? But the world is not fixed. The universe physically is growing and developing. And of course, man's intervention continues and, and is coherent with the universe is growing and developing. But this worldview has actually uh, distorted, uh, actually distorted is not the right word, it is, it is imposed a distortion on policy, which unfortunately uh, our United States continues uh, to follow into the current day. Therefore, what we have to do is we have to change our thinking. 
Therefore, the, the cure, or let's put it this way, not the cure, but the solution to a prosperous globe over the next 80 years with a prosperous Africa is, in, is entirely a mental decision. It's, it's an idea. Whether we begin to generate an idea of development for Africa, or whether we continue to impose this diseased geopolitical ideology will probably determine the future of, of civilization and humanity, at least into this current century. Those are pretty big challenges, and that stretches our minds to think in those terms. But that is the terms that responsible leaders, which we are, and statesmen, which we should be, that is how we really should be thinking uh, about the world today. And the problem, and one indicate one severe feature of the geopolitical doctrine is it does uh, develop, it does reject development. That is, it actually opposes policies in Africa that would lead to progress. Now, if you look, for example, take one case of this, uh, the case of Ethiopia. I mean, there's a lot in the news on the Ethiopian conflict in the northern part of the country, uh, which we can discuss. I'm very, I'm actively involved in that on a daily basis. But let's just look at the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which Nick mentioned uh, last week. That's going to produce uh, 6,200 megawatts of power, 6.2 gigawatts. Now think about the implications of that. Sub-Saharan Africa has somewhere between, that is Sub-Saharan below the Sahara Desert, which excludes the six or seven countries north of the desert, uh, or in the northern part of the desert along the Mediterranean. Sub-Saharan Africa maybe produces 100 to 130,000 megawatts of power for about 1.3, 1.2 billion people. South Africa produces 40,000 of that. So that's one third, one fourth. That means the majority of Africa, and South Africa has about 50 to 60 million people. That means the majority of Africans live in an extreme deficiency of energy. And that energy is actually killing people. Not in the future. We're not talking about the projections by the environmentalist movement, which I don't agree with that the world is heating up and will die in the future. I think there's a lot of those people uh, may be sincere, but they're wrong because Africans and people are dying today, every day, every day for the lack of energy. Energy is killing people in Africa and other parts of the world, but extremely in Africa as we talk. Because without energy, you don't have food production, you don't have transportation, you don't have hospitals, you don't have schools, which all require electricity, you don't have industrial manufacturing. None of that exists on the level necessary without energy. Many people, my position on the COVID-19 vaccine is that every African country should have its own manufacturing capability and distribution capability. But you can't do that without electricity. Those vaccines have to be kept cold. You have to have lights in those hospitals. That doesn't exist without electricity. You can't pump water to dry areas in agriculture without electricity. From my standpoint, there's nothing more important for the African continent than electricity. And I've made this case uh, in Nigeria, and those people are familiar with Nigeria, the example is very clear. Now, look at, go back to the, uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which may have two turbines working by the end of this year, despite the conflict in, in northern Nigeria, uh, northern uh, Ethiopia. This would be a huge input of energy. Now, from my standpoint, it's not enough. 6,000 megawatts is not enough. 6.2 gigawatts is not enough. I want 1,000 gigawatts of power in Africa. But it is a huge increase, and it will benefit not only the Ethiopian population, the majority of which do not have access to on-grid electricity, 
online grid electricity. Plus, it will export energy to Kenya, South Sudan, North Sudan, and probably other countries. Uh, I think maybe Tanzania as well. And the fact that the U.S. government, neither the Republican Trump administration nor the Biden Democratic administration, has congratulated, supported, praised Ethiopia for the GERD is an indication of how far we have drifted away from a positive visionary outlook, which again, Nick presented last week, the relationship between President John F. Kennedy and Kwame Nkrumah. You would not have had the Volta Dam smelting project without John F. Kennedy's personal intervention. So we had a president uh, 60 years ago who believed and had a vision for the development of Africa. And where is that leader now? Is there anybody in the Democratic Republican Party who understands the importance of development for Africa? And why, even if they don't fully understand the importance of development, why are they opposing and not supporting a energy development project? And again, this, this goes back to the decline and shrinking of the thinking of the West. I don't want to insult anybody here because we're the exception, but the majority of our friends and neighbors, the level of intelligence has shrunk. The level of morality has shrunk. Our vision has shrunk. And we don't see our development as essential. The other aspect of the geopolitical policy in Africa is the fact that it defines Chinese as our enemy. It defines any country, any nation that is trying to develop and grow and prosper as an enemy of the West, of the oligarchy of the West, if they don't succumb to the dictates of Western policy. And you see this very clearly uh, in, the, in the Secretary of State Pompeo and the Trump administration, and you see this very clearly with Secretary of State Blinken in the uh, Biden administration and other people such as Samantha Power in the Biden administration, Susan Rice. They, they say that unless the world submits to our democracy, our empty notion, in my view, of democracy, they are our enemy. And they really do not understand democracy at all. And they really do not even understand the founding fathers of this country. I, I question whether they've read the Federalist Papers and they have any understanding that first of all, we're not a democracy, we're a democratic republic that depends on a robust and fruitful discussion of ideas by an educated population. But how can we have an educated population and how can we have a, a high level discussion of policy if our population isn't educated? And if our population isn't educated, our leaders aren't educated because they come from the population. But this is nevertheless democracy, democracy, human rights. Well, from my standpoint, there is no more fundamental human right than the right to development. And there's no more important human right than the right to electricity. So these are some of the larger problems, which are all mental problems. They're problems of idea. The problems of mindset. They're not problems of resources. They're not problems of economics. There is absolutely, as I say, if I and others could be put in charge of a free reign of a policy for Africa, both here and in Africa, I'm, 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 I can convince that I can end, we can end poverty and hunger within 20 years before I reach the point where I may not be as uh, active as I am now. So these are, I think this is some of the ways we should at least inform our thinking when we're looking at, at Africa. And just to give you an example, I'll go back to my sharing the screen. And I, again, I think most of you uh, have seen this before. 
I doubt if it's the first time, but what it shows you, and I, I don't remember the year this was taken, to be honest with you, but what it shows you is the nighttime sky over the world. So it's pretty obvious what exists in the United States on the two coasts. It's pretty obvious what exists in Europe, what exists in India and parts of China. And they look at Africa, there are lights at the bottom, and that's undoubtedly South Africa. And there are lights along the, I guess you call it the Northwest corner up there in the Maghrib in Africa. And then in the whole center part, there's nothing. And I can verify this. I've, I've made, I, don't, I, I forget how many trips I've made to Africa, dozens. And I've flown over parts of the continent, not the whole continent. And this is all true. You just fly for miles and hours and hours and there's no life below. That's not really human development. That's intentional underdevelopment. Now, here's another representation, which shows you, this is, says the date. So on the left, you see a little bit of lights, probably similar to the picture we just saw. And then it, here's a projection of what Africa could look like uh, 30 years from now. And that center spot there because of the person, because of the reason this diagram, uh, this graph, uh, this picture was produced, that's supposed to be Lake Chad, which would be a development center under the Transaqua program, which again, Nick mentioned last week. But you can see the difference. And this is a projection of what could be 30 years from now. And there's no reason it couldn't be. Uh, unfortunately, the way that we are following, the way we're pursuing policy, and I have many, many disagreements and arguments, and I still am arguing <laughs> with Africans, because they don't understand this concept, which I've identified in my previous presentation here as a Hamiltonian conception of economics. They don't understand it. And many of them have fallen into the idea that we really can't be an industrialized nation. And now all we can do is try to develop in our own way, sometimes called the African way, which in many cases means accepting less than anyone else would accept. My view is, if that all of us here participating, we enjoy and properly have the right to enjoy electricity 24 seven, running water that's clean, that can be drink, drinkable, roads, railroads, of course that varies quite a bit country to country, but we expect to live long lives and we should live a long life because human beings are the most precious thing develop, uh, created by the creator. But in Africa, they say, well, we may not get that. Well, why wouldn't they get that? Every human being is endowed with the potential of creativity. And every single human being has the right to the full development of, of their life with dignity, with education, with leisure time for themselves and their children. And unfortunately, the, the victimization has convinced some people that it can't be done, so they maneuver on ways that may they think, well, they can survive. The survival is not the same as development. Uh, now, again, following on Nick's presentation this week, I think it's important, I'm gonna bring up two towering figures in Africa that, indicate the fourth vision that the thinkers had. And these ideas were known and they were written up and they were spoken. And therefore the question we have to ask ourselves is, is why aren't those, why have those ideas not been realized? Why have they not come to fruition? And again, I think this begs the question I said earlier of it's not, an objective problem, it's a subjective problem. And I think if you look, uh, Nick discussed last week, the Black Africa, the Economic Cultural Basis for a Federated State by Chikanta Dia. And if uh, the book is still in print because I buy copies of it for my friends. Uh, so you can order it. And for me, as I see it is from Nick and from my friend in France, Sebastian, it's a very inspiring book. It was printed in 74, 
and I'm sure the ideas were circulating before that in the maybe in the 50s and 60s. But it's uh, far, it's a futuristic vision, which should have, as he says, and I'll read you some quotes, been implemented already. So it's a very worthwhile book to read, and we'll discuss that, and we're also going to discuss the other towering figure of Africa in the 60s, which was is Kwame Nkrumah. But just to read you a little bit, because I know Nick didn't go into this part in detail, he says, Black Africa will have to find a formula of energy pluralism and harmoniously combines utilization of the following sources of energy. And we've just been discussing energy. One is we have to have hydroelectric energy dams, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Two, he mentioned solar energy, which I don't uh, support so much. Three, nuclear energy. Four, geothermal energy. Five, hydrocarbons, that's burning coal, oil, and gas. And fifth, thermonuclear energy. So he was talking a half century ago about nuclear energy, which is fission, breaking apart of uranium 238. And then he's talking about thermonuclear fusion, which is, which is orders of magnitude more powerful because it actually utilizes the energy that holds the molecule together. And if you, by fusing, you reduce more power than by separating such as fusion, uh, fission. He goes on to say, there can be no doubt despite a requisite degree of pessimism, that its applications will become operational within the next 40 years. That is less than two generations. So he's saying 40 years, let's, if we take the time period of the book publication, which I say is probably several years after he wrote it, 1974. So from his standpoint, in 2014, seven years ago, we should have had operational in these areas, including thermonuclear fusion energy. Now that is so far beyond and above the common thinking on the African continent today, much less in the Western world, that it is, it is somewhat uh, mind boggling and shocking. It goes on to say, however, if that source of energy would have become available, with effective control of thermonuclear reactions, that's fusion, not fission, with control of thermonuclear reactions, the energy needs of the planet would be answered for a period of a billion. I repeat, would be answered for the billion, for one billion years to come. There he is on the African continent, suffering all the problems of Africa. And he says, we can have thermonuclear fusion in one billion years. It's, it's really, I mean, it's quite incredible. He says every country would be able to have its own electric setup, which would be more than enough to handle its current needs. He says uh, we should have thermonuclear energy and immediately create a pilot fusion center in an appropriate African country open to all qualified African researchers willing to follow this line of pursuit. Fusion is only, and he goes on to praise what fusion is. Now, he's talking about having a operational center, a highly developed scientific center to study fusion in Africa in the 1970s. And we don't even have 100, 100 watts watts of power per person in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Nigeria, it's well below, uh, it's probably in the order of 50 watts per person just in Nigeria available. We all have 1,500, minimum 1,500 watts available to us 24 seven. So think about that. Think about that kind of vision and that kind of commitment to science and to science in the area of energy. Now, you may not know this, but there's only two nuclear power plants, fission on the entire African continent. Both are in South Africa. Now there are many countries, and, um, and Pip who's on this uh, 
Cole has written extensively on this. I think that she, I think her last report was there's 17 countries who are in various stages of working with the Atomic Energy Commission and, and, other, and Russia, China, India on building nuclear plants. I think uh, Egypt is building three, two or four uh, now, which I think are Russian based. I think uh, South Africa is vacillated from as high as 96 current megawatts in, fusion, in additional fission energy down to, I think they've settled maybe for 3,200, but these are all fission. And yet, the uh, half century ago is talking about that we should have had fusion already, or would have fusion. You can see the discrepancy, and we don't have fusion in the advanced sector. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, this reality of the ideas from Africans was there. It did exist, and it could have been implemented. And again, if you look at the history of Africa, 400 years of slavery from approximately 1420, 1424 into the 1800s was slavery. They just ripped the continent apart. It's the largest forced deportation of human beings in the history of a planet. As bad as everything we're seeing now with migration. I'm not minimizing it, but in comparison, it was nothing compared to the anywhere between 15 and plus million slaves who have just ripped out of the homeland and forced across the Atlantic and others east as well. And then after that, went through 100 years of colonialism, where slavery was replaced, the, the, the property of slaves was replaced with the property of resources. And then in the 1960s, when approximately most of the countries begin their independence movement, it is forced to submit to neo-colonialism under the financial political control of the international institutions. 500 years, a half a millennium of control and domination against the African people. And Diop emerges, and know this, he's not the only one, he's just one of the most spectacular examples of the ability of the human mind to think into the future for his continent. And it's, it's, it's inspiring for those of us who, who love Africa and love the human race. Uh, Diop is, is quite an inspiring individual. And I just have a couple more quotes to read for you. Uh, on atomic energy, he goes on to say, control fission of uranium and thorium is at the basis of atomic energy. And that is true. A chain reaction is created giving off more energy, more enormous heat. And he goes on to discuss that. And he says that we can say that it will become part of the industrial equipment of all modern nations within the next 10 years. So there he is. He says, so by 1984, fission was going to become part of the industrialization of all modern nations, which he meant to obviously include uh, in Africa. And as he goes on to actually talk about the fast breeder, which the breeder reactor uses the spent fuel and uses it as a fuel for further development. So there's almost no waste. And he's, he talks about the benefits of the breeder reactor, that these actors, reactors will produce more fuel than they consume. So this is, uh, I mean, this is quite an extraordinary vision. And he had a very detailed plan uh, for scientific research on the continent. He says, basic research will always remain an essentially a university concern. Therefore, right from the start, the full objectivity, objectivity of the university will be rightly entitled to claim the required funds for construction of high energy accelerators. He said, if we wish to see the African nation everyone is talking about these days adapt itself to the needs of the modern technical world, we have from its very beginning to provide the technical institutions that guarantee the life of a modern nation. 
we should forthwith create the following institutions, an Institute of Nuclear Chemistry and Physics, an Electronics Institute, an Aeronautics Institute, uh, et cetera. So he envisioned that there would be institutes on the continent that would be training the engineers and the scientific cadre to run fission and fusion, not be bringing over others, but do the training and development themselves. This is quite, to me, and as I gather from listening to Nick's class last week and to my friend Sebastian and others, this is inspiring. What's not inspiring is the fact that those projections of what would happen in 10, 20, and 40 years uh, have not come to bear. And the reason they haven't come to bear is because they've been opposed. Having ideas, and, and Diop and others show that any person can have great and powerful ideas, but you also have to contend with great and powerful opposition. And the only reason we don't have this development in Africa today is because people oppose this development. But people oppose fission in the United States. I mean, we have not built a new nuclear reactor since uh, Jimmy Carter uh, was defeated in 1980. That's pretty sad for a so-called invest industrialized economy. But why? That's the point. And why is Africa backwards? And backwards is a very bad term. Why is back, why is China, uh, why is Africa underdeveloped? These are crimes of, of humanity. And we have to fight them. No matter how, how much we think our voices are not being heard, we have to fight them. Now, the other area I want, the other individual I want to introduce you to before I conclude is uh, Kwame Nkrumah. And he is much better known, much more widely known than uh, Chika Antadia. In fact, I think Time Magazine or Newsweek had him on the cover in 1953 or somewhere around there. And he is considered the father of the liberation movements of, uh, of Africa uh, because he led the liberation in, from the British in 1957 in Ghana. And from there, you saw the liberation movements move across, I think there were 30 nations became independent from colonialism in the early 1960s. And then many countries since then. Uh, South Africa was the last country to become independent from colonialism in 1994. But that's only many of these countries and in South Africa, which is another class, proves the case, is they did not become economically independent. They became politically independent, which is good but it's not sufficient uh, for human development. But uh, Nkrumah also had a great vision. And I believe, I'm pretty sure that part of it came from not only his, his studies in the United States in the 1930s, and he became, uh, got degrees in, in religion. I think he taught Greek for a while, learned Greek, uh, quite a scholar. But he was also in the United States during the period of Roosevelt's transformation of the United States through infrastructure. And he came back to Africa with a great vision for an industrialized Africa, for an Africa filled with infrastructure. I'm just gonna read a few quotes from his speech at the inaugural ceremony of the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, which was the predecessor to the African Union. And this is uh, May 25th, 1963. And that's known as that, May 25th is also African day throughout the world because it's the day of the founding of the OAU. There's also a book. So that speech you can get online. Just type in Nkrumah's speech at the inaugural ceremony of the OAU. And then in addition to the book that uh, Nick referenced last week and I am this week, the other book you can get is Africa Must Unite, which is also uh, very interesting. Uh, and I would suggest people, if, you get, if you're interested in this subject, this is uh, very interesting. And I think with this, I mean, my, Nkuma wrote a lot, not all of it, everything I agree with, but he has some good ideas for the future. 
Let me just read you a couple of quotes again to give you the thinking. Now, this is 1963. We were discussing Diop. His book is 1974. I forgot the date. That was in Kuhn's book when it came out. When it first came out, uh, oh, 1963. And, but this is from his speech at the OAU. So now this is the Africans get together, 33, 34 of them, and they establish an African-wide organization, OAU, which, as I say, becomes the AU in 2000. And it's the only African-wide organization existing today. Now, it's not the strongest organization because it's still poor and has to depend on outside funding from the West, but it, at least it's, an, it's a continent-wide organization. Kumar says early on, on this continent, it has not taken us long to discover the struggle against colonialism it does not end with the attainment of national independence. Independence is only the prelude to a new, more evolved struggle for the right to conduct our economic and social affairs, to construct our society according to our aspirations, unhampered by the crushing and humiliating neo-colonialist controls and interference. And then on the economic side, just to emphasize, he says, with capital controlled by our own banks, harnessed to our own true industrial and agricultural development, we shall make our advance. We will accumulate machinery and establish steelworks, iron foundries and factories. We shall link the various states of our continent with communications. We shall astound the world with our hydroelectric power. We shall drain the marshes and swamps, clear infested areas, feed the undernourished and rid our people of parasites and disease it is within the possibility of science and technology to make even the Sahara bloom into the vast field with verdant vegetation for agricultural and industrial development. We shall harness the radio, television and giant printing presses to lift our people from the dark recesses of literacy. Uh, hold on one second. I have to, uh, I think you may be hearing some noise coming in from my, one second. Sorry about that. And just to conclude, uh, or some of his quotes, he says, unless we establish great industrial complexes in Africa, which we can do in a united Africa, we must have our peasantry to, uh, we must, uh, which we can only do in Africa. We must have our peasantry to the mercy of foreign, we must not have our peasantry the mercy to foreign cash crop markets. These ideas of Kuma, industrialization, economic development, the belief in science and technology, these are profound ideas that existed. Look at the COVID crisis today, and Kuma says in his speech, giant machines make roads, clear forests, dig dams, lay out aerodynamics, monster trucks and planes distribute goods, huge laboratories manufacture drugs, complicated geological surveys are made, Mighty power stations are built, colossal factories erected at incredible speed. The world is no longer moving through the bush path or on camels and donkeys. That's 50, almost 60 years ago. And I think this gives you a sense that the African continent <clears throat> is not lacking ideas, just like it's not lacking resources. Just, not, it's just like it's not lacking people. It is lacking the ability, and our, which is our ability, our problem as well, to defeat a geopolitical outlook that wants to keep uh, Africa, back, uh, Africa backwards, <clears throat> and not Africa alone. I'll just share one more thing on the screen with you. 
which is the other area of infrastructure that is absolutely necessary for Africa is transportation. <clears throat> Now, this is a picture of road development. Now, a lot of these roads actually have been completed. Um, so these are highways, transcontinental highways, which have been completed, but they're completed by each country at its own rate and its own capabilities. And you can see north, south, east, west lines. But what's really interesting and would transform now, the potential of the continent is the interconnected high-speed rail, which I have here. Yeah. Africa Integrated High-Speed Rail Network, ASHRAM. And these are rail lines. Now you can see they parallel many of the road lines, but this is rail. Now, I wish they would be all high-speed, which is 150 miles an hour or more. I don't know if that's gonna be accomplished so easily. Uh, and we only have about, <clears throat> we have less than 100 miles track in the United States that can handle a high speed rail that is over 150 miles an hour. <laughs> it's rather pathetic. I think China has 50,000 kilometers of high speed rail, not even talking about magnetic data lift trains. But these rail networks would transform, would revolutionize the continent. East West Railroad connecting the two oceans, the Indian Ocean, Gulf of Eden on the east the Atlantic Ocean on the west, the north and the south. Think about the amount of transportation of goods that would travel, new manufacturing centers, new agricultural centers. I mean, it's amazing. Now, there is development in this area. Uh, Some was presented by Nick last week. We've had the Ethiopia again, a leader in developing a, the first electric uh, rail line run by electricity from Addis Ababa to Djibouti. We've seen progress in Nigeria. I was on my first train ever in Africa, in Nigeria when I was there in April. So there is progress in this area, but this is part of the African Union agenda for 2063. Well, that's 40 years from now. And uh, Pip and I and others have been working uh, to have a much more advanced, uh, more rapid development of high-speed rail, which could be done in less than 15 years. But this, again, requires a vision and a commitment of leaders in Africa and leaders uh, throughout the, the rest of the world. Uh, this, therefore, I would conclude with the fact that, yes, we're seeing progress. No question about it. But from my standpoint, uh, it's too little. It has to be increased and it has to be sped up. We are, I am now working with a group of Africans uh, in the United States and on the continent for an Africa infrastructure development plan. Uh, and this is uh, what I would like to see is an Africa infrastructure bank modeled on Hamilton's bank which would dedicate credit and we'd have to figure out how the bank is capitalized, but like the Marshall Fund, we'd have matching funds for countries to borrow only for infrastructure, not for paying debt or not for the daily operating budget of a country. I believe this can work. It worked for the United States, it worked for China. It's slow going because I can't put all the time into it that I need. But uh, we've had this discussion going on, represent, uh, led by a group of Africans, friends of mine in the, in the United States and in Africa, and we're hoping to present this at some point in the near future. My view is the Africa outlook of Agenda 2063, which I've read, is optimistic, uh, has a vision for the future in rail and electricity and other areas, not as ambitious as my vision. And they're also weak on the question of funding, how this would be funding. And the big problem we have, and this is just among Africans, I get in very, uh, I do get in intense discussions with Africans as I do with Americans. 
they don't understand economics. They don't understand Hamilton economics. They don't understand credit. They don't understand what FDR, Lincoln, and others have did for our country. And the lack of understanding of economics is so severe and so prevalent that it's hard for people to think differently. And so they begin to think of, well, we could do this instead. No, Nkrumah wanted industrialized countries. Nkrumah wanted gigantic complex factories. Diop wanted us to work on fission and fusion. And we should not do anything less. And we should help our Africans to motivate themselves for the same goal and motivate our friends in the West for the same goal. And that's what I do every day of my life, except when I'm hiking and backpacking throughout the Appalachian Trail and other parts of the East Coast. I'm open for any and all questions. Please go ahead. Thank you. And thank you for doing what you're doing, Larry. It is a very hopeful, edifying briefing that you've provided. Um, it's, and it's very rare that there is such optimism for the future. A lot of people cynically just look at all of the problems that are holding us back, but they can't see where the pathways towards an actual functional, brighter future. So for that alone, uh, it's invaluable that you've just done this. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, waiting on the, uh, the queue. The first one um, I've seen here is Magdalena, who has a question about the IMF and World Bank. Yes. Um, hi, Larry. Uh, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Um, first of all, I, I, lately, I haven't heard much about the IMF and the World Bank. Okay? Uh, years ago, we always talked about the World Bank and the IMF and the role in holding back the development of, uh, of nations. Um, what has changed in that regard? Or is there a change in that regard? Or um, what role are they playing nowadays? The role, the role hasn't changed. I think you're right, though, uh, that there has been less discussion with the IMF and World Bank. I think during the COVID crisis, everybody had to change their public relations a bit because it, I mean, I've covered this in articles on my site, but it was obvious that African countries, among other developing countries, were paying a huge share of their revenue for debt service, than they, much greater than they were paying for their healthcare service. I think the financial institutions had to deal with that and take a back seat. And then there's discussions on some kind of debt forgiveness or debt uh, delay in payments. But the IMF policy really hasn't changed, unfortunately. And I do think there is more of African countries and the leaders who are thinking they could be more independent from the IMF and World Bank. Obviously, with China supplying very large amounts of credit for construction of infrastructure, that has also tilted the balance. But you're right in the sense that the people don't uh, see the IMF and World Bank as much as the enemy as they used to, but it's still carrying out the same policy. They will not lend for any long-term large-scale infrastructure. They have, I think, the maximum they may lend for something is seven years, and it's at very high interest rates, either near double-digit or double-digit rates. Uh, and they're really not part of the development. They will, the African Development Bank will issue credit for some small scale projects. I say small scale in the several hundred million, but none of these projects will come into the billion dollar area except the ones coming from China. There are some efforts from Turkey has made some very large advances. I think they've built the Tanzan first phase of the Tanzania rail line. Uh, South Korea is getting involved. Japan is coming back in to some extent. Russia is coming in in uh, its own way, which is a lot of military contracts and agreements. Uh, and I, I think if you look at the statistics, I mean, the, the IMF and World Bank lending for actual development in, in Africa is a shrinking and shrinking. However, if you look at the debt owed, the debt, despite all the huffing and puffing about China, uh, China is only between 17 and 20 percent of the debt owed to a single country. It's still the IMF, the Paris Club, and private lenders who are the largest portion of debt that Africa owes. This is sometimes covered up by the, um, by the uh, propaganda against China. 
But you raise an interesting question. It, it, you certainly are correct. It's not been brought up as much as it was. And I and I, I have to give some thinking about why, why that is the case. But thanks a lot for the question. All right, next up we have Paula. Go ahead. Paula, if you're still there. She was here. She was there. She is in Europe and maybe, oh, there she is. Okay, she's on mute. Hey, oh, Paula, okay. you're, you're on mute. Okay. Hello, Laurie. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you My very pleasure. much for a very fascinating talk and for your engagement, for your continuous engagement. Uh, some time ago, I reviewed a, 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 a devastation of the Delta Niger a, area, mm -hmm. initiated, I would think, by the Shell refinery, but I must say, unfortunately, perpetrated by the local mafia, I would call it, and government. That prompted me to asking you, in your experience, in your view, what are some of the endogenous factors that hinder this energy plan development? And, and can you just say again, where were you? Did you say the Niger Delta? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was talking about, sorry, I'm, I'm sure that my Wi-Fi is not... No, on. Is that, it was that in Mali? The Niger Inland Delta? The, 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 the Delta in, in Nigeria, oh, Nigeria, there was a, a, yes. there was a, a, there's a very, yeah, it's yes. called the, um, uh, it's called, uh, yeah, it doesn't, the population has name that escaped my mind, but it no, ended I'm, up with the hanging of seven people, the journalists, oh. etc. Right. Well, yes, I'm familiar so with that area. Yeah, just as an example that came to my mind as, as how complex the situation obviously is there for right. Yeah, the uh, look, the this is, I was down in the Niger, Nigeria Delta area for I spent a week down there a couple, several years ago when the uh, the extremists were attacking the government and bombing buildings. So I was given a 20 <laughs> I was given a bodyguard for 24 seven to try to at least pers persuade people not to attack our our car and our place where we were staying. Uh, it's the, the Nigeria situation is really complicated. It took, uh, my first country I started going to was Nigeria in the 1990s. So that was a long time ago. And it took me a long time to understand what the problem was. And what you have is that the Nigerian uh, elites were very much um, manipulated by the oil companies. You had the seven sister oil companies. The leading one was the Royal Dutch Shell which came into Nigeria around 1950s. And they set up this arrangement, which is so destructive, where the, uh, the oil companies engage with a cabal of local elites in mainly around the capital then was Lagos and then Abuja. And they ins ensured that there was never domestic energy production. There were four oil refineries, there are four, and all of them operate at 50% or less capacity. There's now one being built by this private uh, Nagoto, I think his name is a very rich Nigerian. They ensured that they couldn't refine their own oil. And therefore they manipulated selling their oil, but then buying refined oil on what's called the spot markets overseas. And then manipulating the invoices of how much oil was on the ships so they could skim enough money off the top. Therefore, it, when people say you had Nigeria corruption, they leave out the fact that it was Nigeria British corruption. It took two, as they say, to tango. And this has, and Nigeria has not recovered from this. And that the, the IMF and the British have had an enormous amount of control uh, over Nigeria. And for example, uh, in 1983, the current president, President uh, Buhari, who I've known for a quarter of a century, he was the military administrator or dictator of the country in 1983, and he kicked out and dealt a deadly blow to the IMF, referring to our earlier discussion, and he was cooed 18 months later. And there's been one coup after another until they so-called brought in democracy, but the democracy presidents haven't accomplished a lot. And there's the big history to this is the British. 
if you study the history of Nigeria from the Royal Niger Company uh, going back into the 1800s through the amalgamation under Lord Lugar and uh, first Sir Goldie and then Lord Lugar, they kept ethnicity and divisions between the country precisely to manipulate the old British policy of divide and conquer. The southern Nigeria where the oil was were treated in one way. The northern Nigeria where the oil wasn't, but they were under Islamic control, were treated another way. And they basically kept these two, more than two, the three main ethnic groups and like 150 smaller ethnic groups. They kept them at each other's throat. And, and actually there's racism. Ethnic racism is very prevalent throughout Nigeria, like a very significant problem. And therefore, people never really united around themselves for the larger picture. So various ethnic groups, uh, I met with the, uh, uh, I met with one of the groups in, in southern Nigeria, I'm forgetting the name right now, uh, who were persecuted. I met with the northerners, been all over the country. And nobody, one of the big tragedies in Nigeria, and you're seeing it play out in Ethiopia today, where I write an article every week on Ethiopia, is the lack of an identity of a nation. They don't have a citizenship of Nigeria. I was able to spend some time, with several visits, with the leader of the Biafra War, Ojuku, from, who started the war in 1967, which was a brutal war, lasted for over three years, uh, in the course of three years. And he said, I'm an Ibu first, not a Nigerian. And you see that now in, in Ethiopia, with the Tigrayans say, no, we're not Ethiopians, we're Tigrayan. This was consciously fostered. Ethnicity was used and created. The whole scandal in Darfur that you may have read about in 2003 during the Bush administration, that was created. They create chiefs. They create administrative districts based on ethnicity. It's, it's horrible. It's disgusting. I hate it. And as bad as the red and blue is in our country, it's nothing compared to ethnicity in, in Africa. And therefore, this has been a really coercive effect. We have in Africa, it exists in Kenya, it exists in uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria, other countries, that there is not a conception of an identity as a citizen of our country. Because really, from my standpoint, all people are more universally similar than the not, than not because of the power of, everybody has the power of creative mind. What our skin color is, what piece of dirt we grew up on, that's not important. Traditions are important, but they're not dominant. Our identity is as identity of human beings endowed with the power of create, creative mentation. That's our identity. Now, the failure of national leaders, and I, I can tell you, honestly, I've had this discussion. I had a discussion with President Bahari. My approach, and I've given this to many African countries, is the leader should develop a national inclusive program for economic development, where each individual and each region and each ethnicity sees the development and success of that program as in their interest like the treaty with fire, the interest of the other is an interest to thyself. But you have to create that, you have to fight for it, you have to educate for that. And one of the things I've told the current government, as soon as we can settle this mess with Tigray, they've got to have a national dialogue, town and hall meetings across Ethiopia, on what is the real identity of an Ethiopian as opposed to ethnicity as an Aroma, Amara, Tigrayan, et cetera. But it's, uh, these are big historical challenges that have kept these countries back and have created problems that we don't really quite realize in the United States. And unfortunately, many of my, I wouldn't call them my friends, people I interact with in Washington, so-called Africanist, they dismiss the history of these countries. They say, ah, that was 50 years ago. That was 100 years ago. That's not relevant today. No, the 500 years of history, in, the last 500 years of history in Africa is very relevant. It's not determinant, but it's very relevant to understanding the problems Africa has today. 
uh, I've been fortunate enough or determined enough to read a lot of African history. By no means do I know it all, but I have enough of a sense of it to know how this was, how the Africans were kept down as a deliberate policy. And my friend up there in the corner, Pip, you can intervene any time on some of these questions of development in Africa. She's, she knows as much or more than I do. Pip, would you like to chime in anything there or shall I go to the next question? Um, yeah, I'd just like to say, Larry, thanks so much. It's amazing. And just to bring up the question of the small modular reactors. Um, earlier on, you were talking about nuclear and um, the fact that if uh, African countries chose to adopt the very latest technology, uh, nuclear technology being the small modular reactors, that they could uh, far exceed any of uh, anyone's expectations in terms of what could be achieved by these, um, because they would be uh, completely um, in, in front of, of all innovation. Um, and one of the beautiful images that um, one nuclear expert put in my mind was that, <clears throat> excuse me, you could link up all the cities of Western Africa using the SMRs. So um, that bulgy bit, if you can see on the map behind me, um, there are cities all along that coast, major, major cities going from um, Douala and Cameroon right up to Dakar in Senegal. And uh, if if the, if the SMRs were adopted, you see they could be water cooled. And uh, SMRs have, um, it's impossible for them to melt down. So there's no safety issue whatsoever ever, other than having a stable state. So uh, I think that would be one fantastic mm -hmm. thing to look forward to. Right, thank you. Okay, uh, Satomi is, on the line here with a question, Satomi. Oh, oh, thank you. Gosh, that's uh, so interesting about you know the um, identity part of. Um, but my question is, um, I used to be a member of the International Christian Chamber of Commerce, and they uh, did a lot of um, of um, work um, partnerships with uh, three African countries. And they had this um, with, with Israel and, and um, a lot of different businesses that would come in there and work with the governments. So that is, a I feel it worked a lot better when the businesses initiated every, you know, and partnered with the government rather than having government with government. I, I don't know what you think of that. Well, the... Um... The, the projects of infrastructure are particular, they have particular needs and they're usually big and they usually take time. And the private sector, which I know well, I've, I've worked for the private sector for short periods of time, they cannot fund infrastructure projects, not the roads, rail, energy that we need. This has to be done by public credit or cheap credit from friends and allies. Like the Chinese concessional loans are 3% interest rate over 15 years and include a, a possible grace period, as opposed to the Western loans, which can be anywhere from seven to 12%. Uh, and the private sector does not have the capital to fund these infrastructure projects. And the, they know that. What they can do is they can, as you're suggesting, they can partner. If you look at what Roosevelt did in the, in the United States between 33 and, and, and the early 40s, he used the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to, to provide the credit. And you hired private sector companies and put people to work. And that's the way it should be. If we build these high-speed rail trains, or the SMRs, as Pip was suggesting, we're going to hire the private sector. We're going to, we should be hiring the best and the brightest of each individual country. And therefore, they will get employed, but they can't fund them. And therefore, you're going to have to have a national or transcontinental or regional 
regulated and funding mechanism. And with that, I don't think there's any dichotomy between the private sector, but I've had real arguments with Africans who believe that we can build the infrastructure without the without public sector. And that won't happen. That I don't that won't happen in five or more lifetimes. There, you need no no private sector is going to invest billions of dollars in rail or, or nuclear energy. They're not going to do it. This is the responsibility of government. This is the obligation of an elected government is to intervene and nurture the economic process when required. And of all the African, now uh, President Bahari has done an enormous amount on rail production. I mean, you're talking about 40, $60 billion in potential contracts to build a, a rail line from north, south, north, and also around the coast of Africa. Again, the PIP is latest out on her website. Uh, that's big. And uh, the Ethiopians have a very conscious model of the state intervening, again, to nurture economic development, as was done by the United States and as continually done by those presidents of ours who are followers of the American political economic system. So this can work, it does work, but we, the Chinese have done a lot, but they're not gonna do everything that's required. And I, there may be signs of pulling back a little bit, but we could have the United States providing low interest credit, China providing low interest credit, India, Korea, South Korea, Japan, Russia, and we would not be bumping into each other. There is such a great need in the tens of trillions of dollars of infrastructure in Africa that it can be done, but you're not going to make double digit profits overnight like you do on the stock market. You're going to develop a country which is far more important than making money. Well, I think the private sector could really give a lot of advice and help. Well, even my brother who um, has, uh, he worked with the First Nations and the government. He was like a liaison and did a lot of, of um, mm -hmm. you know, put together a lot of, a lot of uh, great um, yeah, loans and different things that the First Nations yes. were not as familiar with. And right. so that's kind of what I see with, with uh, the ICCC. They did, I think, a lot of that to help. Um, I know Ben, ben in, I think, is that a, was one of the countries. I forget the other one, other two. But, you know, that's why I say, yeah, because really the business people are the ones that have um, a lot of, like you say, the economic leg to the whole um, projects. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Could I jump in there, Larry? Sure. Um, just to say, you know, like um, having witnessed Afghanistan and uh, heard Bahari say that he, his uh, greatest uh, concern about uh, what was happening in, in Afghanistan was that it would send a message to extremists in Africa that you know if you if you hang on in there for long enough you can have the country. <laughs> so it's and and that that's just tying in with the building of infrastructure. So really, and I'm sure it's the title of of one of your um, many wonderful articles, Lawrence. That, that the West can't uh, afford, the, you know, the, the world can't afford not to build this continental railway network right. and the, the highways. Uh, to take for um, an example, Eastern Congo, where there is a complete 100% absence of any tarmac road or railway, and yet they have um, airports to, to ship ship out the the, uh, the resources, primarily the coltan, and uh, the militias and the rebel movements, these are all highly active, um, and you can't you you can't ever change that situation. Like you know already in um, northern Nigeria, and we've got Mozambique now. That's all kicking off. Um, 
and and a few other places, Somalia, definitely. And and you can't tackle that that problem of extremism and terrorism without uh, tackling the poverty, the unemployment, yes, yeah. and that all directly comes down to infrastructure. So it's it's the one key thing. It's the most basic thing. And I think uh, a Congolese friend of mine he said in his words that uh, that that is the greatest humanitarian aid you can give is infrastructure. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry for taking over your role, Matt. No, that's great. <laughs> I love the tag team. No, that that's really great, and and also. Uh, for those listening online as well, uh, Larry has referenced to this idea of Hamiltonian banking for Africa. And that is something which has really been banned from many of our, the, the teaching curriculums of micro or macroeconomics over many decades. You don't learn about this. You're not allowed to learn about this technique of thinking about economics in the way that people like Franklin Roosevelt did, uh, or Lincoln, or many of the greatest American statesmen. Um, and I'm going to put a link to Larry's class on a Hamiltonian solution for Africa that he gave a few months ago to us um, as an entry point to begin to wrap your mind around this different way of thinking about economy, which is just so vital uh, to really study. And on that note, Larry, I don't know if there's any um, words that you want to maybe uh, throw out there regarding Hamiltonian banking. Like what I was thinking to myself when you were talking about a Hamiltonian bank for Africa, is this, would it have... Um, like a, a branch in each of the different African nations that would all s have membership to the bank, kind of like an African, um, I guess the way the IMF was originally intended to be or the World Bank, but except specifically for Africa? Or do you have a different, how would this well, look like? Uh, that's a good question. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm working it out. That there are advantages that we can learn from uh, the Marshall Plan. Because the Marshall Plan lent money to countries, and that money was matched by the country. Now, the country had a lot of freedom in how they invested that money, and the Germans were the most intelligent, and they used it to help fund an infrastructure uh, bank that rebuilt their coal and steel industries. Many other European countries just used it to pay off debt. I'm thinking about how do we create a bank with a trillion dollars in stock or capital. And that, so how do we get that investment? That would have to come from other countries. Now, as I say, there is a precedent because the African Development Bank is actually capitalized by, 60% of it is capitalized by countries outside of Africa. How do you capitalize a bank? So you have a hundred, you have a trillion dollars in stock, and then you have to set up procedures to lend it out I'm not sure you need a bank in each country, but you would need to set up a policy. So a country, let's say, applies for a, 50, a $10 billion loan. How much of that do they have to co-match? And what are the terms of the loan? Uh, and I think we could set that up because we can specify exactly where these loans have to go. And we can specify, the African countries are poor. They don't have much what's called foreign exchange and they can't use their currency <laughs> no african currency is worth anything once you leave that current country it's, it's very sad mm. i used to have a lot of naira of course it has no value here for me in the united states i usually try to empty all my money before i leave a country but uh, so we have to figure out do, does the country have to match 10 percent of a five billion dollar loan what are the terms of payback with the interest rate You'd have to have a monitoring agency. A lot of this stuff was laid out by Hamilton, but it's going to be a little bit different because it's not going to be a bank that unites the whole continent. We had one bank that united the 13 colonies. So it's not going to replace the individual currencies or individual banks. So we have to set up a relationship, a borrowing relationship from this infrastructure bank. But I'm convinced that unless we do something like this, and I was asked to begin this project by Africans in the United States who are very pro-Biden. I'm not exactly pro-Biden, uh, but they were. And they said, look, why can't we 
present a proposal to the Biden administration to help Africa. I said, well, I don't think there's any disposition to help Africa. But they, they, they wanted me to do it, so I, it's hard for me to turn them down. But um, that was the original idea, is we would make a proposal to the Biden administration to help fund this bank, which I don't think it's going to happen. So I, I'm trying to come up with another idea. But you, at a trillion dollar of capital funding, you could then engage in a number of projects around the continent. Now, it'd be good if the leaders of the continent and the AU would come together and say, okay, these are our 10 priorities of what we want funded and built. That would be very good. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how that mechanism works either. But as I mentioned to you in the African Union Agenda 2063, which anybody can read, it's about 200 pages, they, uh, they don't have a way of actually enforcing this. And one of the criticisms of the African uh, high-speed rail, integrated high-speed rail network is again, there's not a mechanism for enforcing the fast implementation of building this railroad. And the, the advantages of doing it quicker are much better than the advantages of doing it slower. Hmm. There is now the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which went into effect in January. Again, how committed is that institution to infrastructure? If it's not committed to infrastructure, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Because the trade among African countries is 13 to 15% of their export and imports. Imagine that. That means 85 to 87% of their trade is outside of the continent. And that would change under an integrated network of rail and energy, et cetera. Uh, how are we going to win over countries? I mean, there are people I talk to in many different countries who like what I say, like these ideas. Uh, if we can get them to run with them, there are very interesting developments coming out of the current president of Ghana. He's made some very interesting initiatives on rail development and other areas. Can, is this enough? Do we have enough impetus to push forward into a big transformational plan? That's a, that's a challenge. Um, I don't know why we can't go faster. I've been working on Transaqua for Nigeria for a quarter of a century. I was there in April. I thought I'd put everything in place to move it forward, and I was wrong. <laughs> it didn't move forward. Uh, so the internal mechanism of these countries has to be overridden by a great imperative for development of their people. Mm. A long answer to a very good question. No, it's a, it's a great answer because it's it's more complex and oftentimes uh, sitting you know uh, on my couch, it's easy to contemplate um, solutions you know like without thinking about the, the proper nuance and complexity of the thing on the ground. And you know, like part of me was thinking, well, you know, Hamilton was able to take the unpayable debts of all the states and create a federal. A proper debt after everything was reorganized that was would be tied to the growth of the long term needs of the of right. the nation. Of course, that was one nation with one sort of character type. Whereas with Africa, it's a very different ball game. Doing that's not so easy. And Hamilton was a genius. That helped too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'll give people one last chance. Uh, is there any final questions or thoughts people would like to throw out before we let? Uh, Lawrence, get back with his uh, busy schedule. Okay. Short, right? Short, are you raising your hand? No, okay. No. So do you want to, is there a, a final parting thought you'd like to leave us with? I, uh, look, the money is there because it's just credit. And when people say we don't have the money, this is just uh, silly. Going back to what Pitt mentioned earlier, we have spent billions of dollars not millions, billions, so-called training the military and the Sahelian nations and fighting counterterrorism. And we've seen how Mali fell in 2012 and all these um, coups since then. Imagine taking the same money, which came out of American taxpayers and our budget, and putting that into infrastructure. Wouldn't that be much better? So when people say the money isn't there, it is there. What is not there is the vision and understanding mm -hmm. to actually develop this huge continent, which can be developed. I know it can. 
and if, uh, if I had the power given to me, I could do it. And we can do it, but it requires leaders and statesmen who understand this the way Kennedy did, the way Roosevelt did, and I'm sure the way Lincoln would have done if he had lived in this period. So we have to make a, we have to create great leaders and statesmen who have a moral vision for the entire world for the next, as you would say, 100 to 1,000 years. But I'm willing to just work on the next 30 years. We need philosopher kings. We have to. Yes, philosopher kings and golden souls. We have to repopulate the world with golden souls. Amen to that. So that is that. Much. Thank you very much, Larry. And for everyone uh, who's interested next week, we are going to uh, follow this up with the presentation on the future of science. Uh, what will science policy be? What sorts of problems will people encounter 100 years or more in the future as we're making breakthroughs into the atom? And uh, the person. The, the presentation will be given by Jonathan Tenenbaum, who many of you have listened to with his reputation of artificial intelligence a few months ago, um, tackling Louis de Broglie and some of the work in the quantum that has fallen to the wayside over the past uh, several generations, which he and uh, other people around the world are working to revive. So that'll be next week at, I believe, two o'clock, maybe four o'clock. I will send an, inver uh, an email out with that information in a few days. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Larry, for sharing. Until next week. Shukun Gazarian. Show.